If people knew the lengths that I go to to bring y'all these episodes, how much opposition comes my way before I can even turn this camera on. She is dark as obsidian. And it's light and beautiful and bright as the sun. The salt of the earth, fire burning and water dripping. How could they be using goddess of magic? She is timeless. The plug that doesn't need a plug. She is the wildest woman. And let me say it again. For those who need to hear it, the black woman is God. Let me say it again, the black woman is God. just ordered a new onboard video microphone for my Sony ZV-1 so we don't have to go through all that crackling anymore. I mean, it only gets better when you stick around here. All right, the subject for today's podcast is featurism. So it is time to call the roll. I need all my insecure little black girls to the front of the class. Today isn't going to be a read but it's definitely going to be a drill. Before we get into today's content, I just want to give a sincere thank you to all of my new subscribers. I recently got an influx of new subscribers over the past couple of days, and I would love to just take the time and call you out by name but I won't in the essence of time. I will say, however, that I am going to take all of the subscribers that I'm receiving over the next couple of weeks and place you all into a drawing for um, some merchandise. I have some nice wireless woman merchandise and potentially some and potentially some copies of my books. Um, if that's something that you're interested in, make sure you just drop a comment below. I will reach out to the winners directly to let you know that you've won and give you the opportunity to select your gift. I do want to just go ahead and give a holiday message and say thank you for taking time out of your holiday family time to just chill with me. It means a lot to me. And hopefully you get something out of today's content that makes it worth your time. Being a proud milestone millennial, I can honestly say that was a different time in the 80s. Black people still had a little bit of community and self-efficacy, so you didn't feel the effects of the isms like you do now. I mean, we had colorism back then, but it really wasn't as prominent in the black community as it is now. We always had racism, of course. We had texturism back then, but I can honestly say that while I have dealt with all the isms, sexism, racism, colorism, texturism, I never fell prey to the featurism stigmas. 
Um, even from a young girl, I was called very exotic. Um, I am a person of multiracial identity, which just about any American born black person is going to say that. I mean, you got Indian in your family somewhere. Every last one of us is a descendant of some slave owner, some intermarrying and mix of, mixing of races in this country. You're just not going to get past that as, a, as an American-born Black citizen. There's been some sort of interracial... There's been some sort of interracial mix that's responsible for your existence here on some level. So from a young girl, I've always been told that I look very exotic, that <laughs> I actually get asked all the time what I'm mixed with, to which I always answer, nigga and mo motherfucking nigga. Nah, to which, <laughs> to which I always answer, you know, human. I don't have any alien, canine, or feline DNA. It's just all humans over here. So here's the thing, I am mixed, mixed just like almost all of my black brothers and sisters in this country because we have the blood of some slave owner somewhere running through our veins more than likely. So for me, because I've always had what people consider to be refined features, I have had a certain amount of privilege. All of the isms are based on some level of privilege. So whether it's white privilege or pretty or pretty privilege, all of these particular isms come along with some level of privilege. Well, I have received the benefits of having somewhat Euro Asian features. Those are the elements that are a part of my diluted African strain. We as Black Americans have become something intrinsically different than the indigenous African people. But being a kid of the 80s, you could still be Black and exotic. You know, all of our exoticals at that time were classified as Black. You had Jody Watley, Ray Dawn Chong, Vanity. Even if they were biracial people, because there are only two races, black and white, I know everybody wants to add culture to ethnicity, but race as a social construct just doesn't work that way. When we were dealing with European standards of beauty, everything that was not white was considered exotic. But for some odd reason, we made this shift from black exoticals to white exoticals being the measure of beauty, but I find it odd because everything that's considered to be exotic about white people are what we would consider to be black features. You know, for me having a somewhat, <laughs> my mom had the bell pepper nose, you know what I'm saying? And so I got the smaller nose with the smaller ridge, lips that are full, but not thick. I have full lips not thick lips, but now you have this exaggerated version of white people doing a caricature of how black people look, and that is considered exotic. White and tan women who are exaggerating their features and body type and phenotype to look like black women, but yet it's the color of their skin that is making them desirable or attractive over black women. And I find and I find that to be so hypocritical because every other phenotype there is comes out of black people and black features. You can't get curly hair from straight hair. You can't get a thick nose from a thin nose. You can't get thick full lips from thin lips. Everything that we deem to be attractive now in society has come from the dominant genes and culture. So to now turn around and tell the black woman who's the mother of every other phenotype that her features are not attractive is like the greatest of hypocrisy when you think about it. So I've got a little bit of story time. 
because story time, that's got to be like a permanent fixture. Everything that I talk about on this channel comes out of some personal experience that I have had. So I was at my HBCU, FSU. I was the ace of my line in my Greek letter organization. And I had started to date, loose term, you know, in college dating. I had started to date the ace of my brother fraternity's line. And so, you know, we, we, we crossed over in the spring and we, you know, dated some and got to know each other, but then you go to the summer and you know, your relationship is like not official. If y'all don't keep in touch over the summer, like it's like an etch a sketch, you shake it over the summer and you come back, it's nothing left. So during the summertime, you know, we had actually made plans to meet up. We lived somewhat close to each other. I was in Charlotte and he was in Gastonia and I had a car. He didn't. So I went to go see him in Gastonia and, you know, there are all these pictures. So I go to his house and there are all these pictures on the wall, pictures of Martin Luther King and, you know, his mother and his grandmother, just all these dark faces. We would always make these jokes with each other like, you so black. No, you black. You blacker than me. You black. And you got to watch that. You got to watch that. I always thought that was like an innocent thing. But we're... But I'm there and we start to talking and he says to me, you know, I don't really think when we go back that we should continue to date and see each other. And of course, I'm like, yeah, yeah, OK, you know, OK, I ain't trying to say it like that, but I was a cheerleader. I was Greek. You know, I had a lot of things going for myself. So it is what it is. You know, no dust off my shoulders on this one. But I asked him, I said, you know, why? I just want to know. Curiosity. And he said, well. You know, you're just too dark for me. So now I'm feeling some type of way because I've been dark skinned since I met you. It wasn't like it, it wasn't like it was like a penis that I had been hiding or something like that. Like it was dark skin on my face. Like we're the same color. Your mom is darker than me. Like what is all this about? And so I asked him, I said, you know, I, I've been dark since you met me. So why is it an issue now? And he said, I mean, yeah, you're dark, but you got light skin features. Baby, when I tell you, I had never heard of light skin features, like flabbergasted. Okay, I know y'all gonna want the rest of that story. So we get back to school. He starts dating a girl that's just somewhat lighter than me, kind of just right on the other side of that paper bag. She had some really like mannish, <laughs> you can't say that. She had strong features. She was a handsome girl. And, um, you know, she ended up cheating on him with like the drum major. But I digress, okay? Because that wasn't the point of the story. The point of the story is that I have received a certain amount of privilege that I know I don't share with other women of my complexion because of my features. It can feel good at times to have a certain amount of separation from other women who share your characteristics. Ultimately, ultimately, if we're going to have the type of dominance that black women were created to have, we are going to have to separate, we're going to have to get rid of the divisions that separate us. At the end of the day, we're not the ones who benefit from us being stratified from each other. There has to be a common, there has to be a common respect for the physical differences between women amongst women or else we're going to continue to be exploited in that way we're going to continue to be exploited and pitted against each other in ways that really only benefit misogynistic narcissistic men that are running the society into the ground because nobody's getting what they want somewhere along the way we move from afro exoticals to euro exoticals and it's odd because the and that's odd because even with Afro-Latinas and Caribbean women and just women of color broadly around the world, you see so much variety amongst us. You see women who have more prominent features to women who have more refined features. And there's a difference between race and phenotype. 
what we consider to be an attractive phenotype actually doesn't change much between the races. You know, men who find a certain type of woman attractive based on phenotype aren't going to have the same issues with race that other men who are actually trying to phase out their phenotype by picking women of other races. And that's how we ended up here in this first place. Because a lot of the first biracial and multiracial children that we had were products of rapes. They were, they were children that had black mothers, you know, but now that white women are being made single mothers, just like black women have been made single mothers by black men, we're going to see more and more and more children that have identity issues. And that's the reason why we have to, and that's the reason why we have to get rid of all of these divisions behind race and color and phenotype. You know, I would love to live in a colorblind world. I think that would be beneficial in a lot of ways because the issues that really divide us are economic. They are political and social issues. We need to deal with a lot of legal reform when it comes to racism. We need to deal with a lot of social reform when it comes to economics. We need to be able to deal with a lot of educational reform when it comes to our politics. But we never get to that place because we're stuck in these because we're stuck in these levels of desirability. So there was a time in my life where I was black first, you know, and I felt like the plight of black people was paramount to me living the life that I, to me being able to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. But, you know, I don't feel that way anymore. You know, if you'll notice in my background every day that sign changes if y'all haven't noticed that go back to the other videos and take a look at what that sign says in each video because it says something different in each one but I now know that the future is female just by watching so much division that has occurred between women I know that there has to be some sort of reckoning I know there has to be some favor on us for this time, you know, that we've been chosen. God has always chosen the underdog. You know, the Jews were chosen at a certain time because they were being oppressed by almost every group in the world. Even in Egypt, when they were brought out of exile, you know, there were great shows and displays that God used to humble the other groups and people in the world. And right now, women are just under so much persecution that I just have to believe that there is something to that. Um, that is not just happening haphazardly, you know, but our exodus, our time is coming. And when that time comes, we have to be prepared to lead. And as long as we're caught up in the things that divide us from each other, we'll never be able to put out a hand of solidarity to each other. You know, as a woman who has enjoyed a certain amount of privilege, you know, whether it be from my features or my shape or even my skin tone. You know, there is dark skin pride. You know, there are people who say exclusively, I only date dark skin women. You know, and when you are a part of that chosen class, whatever the criteria for being chosen is, it's easy to feed into the divisions that place you on a higher pedestal than other women that are around you. But there's a difference between the value of a woman and the quality of a woman. And if you're going to be a quality woman, you don't need to have any other woman's desirability be suppressed in order for you to be brought forward. You know, we have to begin to lead with the characteristics. We have to begin to lead with the content of our character instead of just what we can put on. That's that enhanced femininity piece that I was talking to y'all about in another video. Enhanced femininity is something that's accessible to anybody because it's one size fits all. 
you know, this is where the transgender agenda comes in. And I, I want to say that I support everyone that is in the LGBTQIA plus community. You know, I'm a kid from the 80s and everything seems to be expanded. You know, we used to just have racism. Then we got colorism. We didn't just have colorism. We got texturism. We went from texturism to featureism. We used to have the L and the G. Then we had the L, the G, and the B. We had the L, G, B, then the T. So yeah, we just going to keep adding on, I guess, until we get all the alphabets in there. I definitely am not a person who is willing to be divided against anyone who wants to see power be returned to people. So, so I am not in support of every agenda. If I have to be in order for us to be friends, then oh well, like I said, y'all can hey y'all instead of hey yo, cause you know what to do if you don't like it. I am for power in the hands of people and whatever those people look like or do in their personal time, I have respect for so long as they respect the agenda of empowering people instead of agendas, government, propaganda, tyranny, capitalism, fascism. As long as you're against those things, my enemy's enemy is my friend. So I'm not going to pretend or be facetious enough to make anybody believe that I support everything that other people do, but I'm not against anybody who's for the things that will, I'm not against anybody who's for the things that bring freedom in this country for all. The transgender femininity piece comes in when the tenets of gender are accessible to everyone. What makes a transgender female a female and what makes a cisgender female a female are two totally different things. But if we're dialing in femininity and sex and gender in one way, that doesn't even give the trans population the determination that they need to be set aside and set apart. You know, there is an integrity to what it means to be a woman inherently female and feminine. And those traits are the things that a woman should be able to lead with her femininity and the uniqueness, the exoticness of that, the content of her character, what her ambitions, what her mind is made up of, her study habits, her disciplines. These are the things that make these are the things that determine the value of one woman from another. Her skills and aptitude, you know, these are the these are the attributes that we need to be putting forward as women if we expect to be respected and regarded, to be heard, to be the leaders that we are being groomed in this season to become. We're watching a lot of systems that are run by males. We're watching an overabundance of narcissism and misogyny run this country into the ground. If we do not begin to invest in our non-sexual value as women, we are going to become an underclass. That's what's happening. The isms are running over everything. You know, racism is doing its perfect work and sexism is right there being its sexy cousin finessing us. Like we getting finessed, ladies, and it's time to stop being finessed and start doing some of the finessing, you know, and that's not going to happen so long as we're playing to the dance of the Pied Piper of what men want in a woman. I just want us to be able to focus on feeding our children and building our communities, being a support system for each other and learning the skills and aptitudes and the wisdom that our, that our elders and ancestors had. If we don't get back to that place, the children are lost for sure. And as much as the men don't want to believe and accept it, they are lost without us being in our place and our place is not underneath their foot our place is being shoulder to shoulder with them people talk about the yoke and the yoke being unequal but what makes the yoke equal you would have to under 
In order to understand what makes a yoke equal, you would have to understand agriculture and agricultural terms. A lot of people think, oh, we're both Christians. So now that means that we're equally yoked. Does not, does not, sir or ma'am. An equal yoke would be two oxen that are yoked together. They would yoke an older oxen with a younger oxen. They would yoke the older oxen because it knew the way and it understood what the master wanted and how to run the plow with a younger oxen because they had the strength and the vitality to be able to pull it. Sometimes things complement each other and that's the best balance for a situation. In an equal yoke, both oxen don't necessarily do the same thing. So women, you're put into this yoke for your wisdom, for your intellect, for your intuition. Men are put into the yoke for their strength and their direction. And I'm going to go into greater depth in another video about how women are actually the head and men are the body and how Eastern religions explore this concept a little bit better than Christianity does. Because when we talk about headship, when we talk about headship as a protective measure, we're not necessarily talking about a positional aspect. So, so in another video, I am going to expand on that because the eyes, the mind, the intellect, all of those things come from a woman in the relationship and therefore the woman is the head. The, the strength, the vitality, the ingenuity to actually accomplish a task comes from a man, which is why he's the body, the arms and the legs that carry the woman who is the head. Trust me, it's going to be great. It's going to be epic. It's going to change everything you think about what you're supposed to contribute to your relationship as a woman. You are not an ox. You are not a dull, dumb ox that's doing the work of your relationship. You're the eyes, the intellect, the intuition. You're the mind. You're the mouth that directs the path, that, that takes in the food, taking in good food that the body eats when the woman prepares food for her family. It should be food that's nourishing to the body. You're the mouth. You get to make those decisions about what goes down into the body. You know, it's your words. Men tell us this all the time. Your words that can bring out the best or the worst in him. It's your words that speak life or death into him. So as women, we're the head. Anyway, moving on. So if we as women don't begin to take our rightful place and stop letting silly divides, one, divide us from each other because we should be taking our cues and learning about womanhood from each other, not Kevin Samuels. Okay, need you to know that. Need you to know that he doesn't know what a woman is. Gay men don't know what a woman is. Transgender men can't tell you they're not living the woman female experience that a cis woman is. They're just not. And so we have to begin to take those cues from each other, even on showing transgender women what their image, what image they are actually reflecting. We've got to get this image, the, the image of a woman under control, under wraps. We've got to begin to reflect and to project the correct image of womanhood. And we're not going to get there with division in our ranks. So I hope something that I've said today makes an impact or at least gives you something to think about, something to come back again for next week. Because until then, I am your girl, Debbie and Nikki. Make sure to follow me on all of my social media. If you want to contact me for any reason, my email is admin at thewirelesswoman.com. Until the next one class is now dismissed.